Have you recovered yet from the <laughs> the uh, the shock of a lifetime? Uh, the the uh, the the odd said no, but the uh, the ping pong ball said yes. Ping pong ball said yes, and uh, the number one overall selection. Yeah, no, I'm. I still, I think, you know, riding a little bit of a high. I it's it's. I think I've convinced my. I spent you know almost the full season convincing myself that you know it's it's not going to happen because the odds say it's probably not going to happen so I just didn't even I didn't even go there uh mentally to be honest I just kind of thought about other players and other scenarios and and planned accordingly because um you know it's just it's just kind of uh you know it it just probably wasn't going to happen the the odds dictated that we weren't going to get that number one pick and and so you know I just kind of avoided a, a certain pool of of prospect and and then obviously when you get number one and you get your pick of of the whole group it's it's pretty exciting and definitely, uh, you know, it gets everyone pretty fired up. So, Kyle, when you have all of the draft capital that you have accrued and when you have more salary cap space than any team in the league, and now that you have the chance to draft a generational talent who will go unnamed for the purposes of this uh, conversation, <laughs> but how does all of those realities that are now in front of you affect the timetable for the Hawks to get back into the mix of being a legit Stanley Cup contender, um, you know, I, I, it, it's it's obviously all favorable, right? And, and that that uh, almost everything there you mentioned is by design, um, minus the number one pick, because that that's something that um, you know is is just is just good fortune. Um, but the, the draft picks, the cap space. It's all it's all by design and 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 for for good reason in this rebuild and um, you know the one thing about the cap space and I've been asked about it a lot with uh, with respect to now now what do you can do this summer is that you know what I think what we've seen and 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 how we've we've sort of studied the landscape in in the NHL is that you can really stunt your ceiling and your upside as a team by spending too early and and hopefully we've got. Uh, enough good players coming in, young good players coming in as the new core that, you know what, they're going to require most of that salary cap space. And the last thing we want to do is acquire all these young players, all this exciting young talent, all this great draft capital. We use it, they get here, and then we jump too early in free agency in our life cycle. And now we've got to, we can't pay some of those great, exciting young players. That's the last thing we want. And so we're going to be really intentional about it. Uh, we're going to stay focused on on acquiring the best young talent we can. And, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the draft capital, hopefully, uh, and as well as the cap space. That can all go into acquiring more quality young talent. So we're we're going to see what opportunities come our way, but we're going to stay dedicated to our path here and and, uh, and and just try and build this thing through through quality youth. It, that is uh, – that's fascinating because you st- you, you're, you've got to play the long game, right, even though – now all of a sudden things could the timeline could shift right you 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 don't know how impactful this could be but there have been a lot of there's been a lot of speculation that it could be really impactful really quickly yeah like you know i think the 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 great thing about this draft is that there's so many it, it, it's such a great draft and, and especially right near the top there's some really really elite talent available and um, you know what? That's that's extremely exciting. Uh, the the one thing that you never know um, in, in your in your build is is how high the ceiling is on some of your best players, and and so that's that's something we feel really good about that we'll be able to bring in someone with an extremely high ceiling, um, but that we still have to do a lot of work to to fill out the team around them, and uh, it's. You know, it, it, it'll take it'll take a little bit of time. Uh, you know, I, I think that we still have to be patient with this approach because we're we're trying to build a team. And, and the last thing that we want is to top out as as a you know a middle of the road team. Our goal is to be a contender. Um, you know, it's there. They'll you never know how high you can get when when you get that contender status. But you want to be in the conversation, and and you know we don't want to be in the middle. And so we're going to do everything we can to to build the best team possible uh, and, and not just bring, you know, get excited and say the job's done after, after we get one or two really good players. So the draft June 28th in Nashville. So Kyle, forgive my ignorance on this question, but how does it work with the NHL in other drafts 
in other leagues, you can bring in prospects for pre-draft visits. So are those planned, and I guess more specifically, even though you can't commit to who you're going to pick, would you invite Connor Bedard for a pre-draft visit to Chicago? Um, you, it, it is permitted. The, the one kind of unique thing about the schedule this year is that the combine is later, and it, so there's less time in between the, uh, the NHL draft and the combine, and you can't uh, bring in any players on visits prior to that combine that's that's i think it's the first week in june so there's not much time in between um we get we get an opportunity to meet with the the top 100 players uh for the draft in buffalo at the combine the first week of june so we'll use that time the best we can and we'll see if uh we don't have anything planned with any prospects on on bringing them in for special visits at this time and and i'm not i'm not totally sure if that's something we'll do prior to the draft but um, kind of something we're working through now, now that we have a better idea with where we sit. Um, you know, we keep hearing that this is an amazing collection of players in this draft. And, and part of it is uh, with COVID and the shutdown of a season, there are sort of more mature players. There are almost three classes of players. There's a lot of depth to the draft. You also have a pick. Uh, in addition to the first overall pick, you'll have 19 or 20, depending on results. You'll have uh, four second round picks. Uh, have you have you already begun the process of working out the entirety of the draft? Is there a chance that you could try to get up higher in the draft from 19 or 20? Is that another thing that you're talking to people about? How do you determine the best way to invest all the the draft capital you have yeah no it's it's a great question um it, it's it's definitely something we're exploring i think again as i said earlier we're going to be um the the level of success we reach is it will be dictated by the level of player we can acquire and and you know logic dictates that the higher you are in the draft the better chance you have of getting a good player and so we're we're going to explore the opportunities available to us to potentially move up. Again, it's a good draft, so that that means people don't necessarily want to move down, and so you know it might not be there for us. Um, we're gonna we're going to explore it. Uh, you know, right now we've got um, eight picks in the first three rounds of the draft, which that that is a lot, and and I will concede that that that's a lot. I think it's probably unlikely. That we we make all of those picks. So how that uh, manifests itself, whether it's in a move up, whether you know what, maybe we move some players or some picks for for future picks or, or something like that. Um, you know that remains to be seen. But it, that's a lot of picks. But in the end, you have to have the currency to be able to to you know give yourself options, and and that's what we we do have, and we have it provided ourselves with with some of the work we've done the last two trade deadlines. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what, what happens, but we're definitely looking to be active when we get down to Nashville. So, Kyle, big picture. As you know, since you got the number one pick and you won the NHL draft lottery, there's been some backlash. There's been columnists who have written that maybe the Blackhawks didn't deserve this pick. Or they should have been deprived uh, the, a first rounder because of the Kyle Beach situation that you have moved on from organizationally and done a lot of work in that direction. You also have fans who might be very conflicted about, is it okay to feel excited about the Hawks again or hockey in Chicago? How do you address those people who might feel some ambivalence here, some, some mixed feelings about whether or not to get excited because of what this organization has been through the last several years? Uh, yeah, no, you know what? I, I think, I think that's a, a natural uh, train of thought, right? The, the, the natural skepticism based on, on what did occur here and what we learned occurred uh, in the past. But, you know, what? and, and I'd, almost, I'd almost push back a little bit on how, how you frame that. I don't think we have necessarily moved on. It, it, it's more so, you know, it, it shapes some, you know, everything we do uh, every day, how, how, we, how we monitor, how we communicate, how we educate, and, and, and how we learn. Uh, and, and how we advocate, you know, it, it's something that, um, you know, is, is we obviously denounce, we, we work to, to, you know, be better for every day. And, and um, I understand the, the conflicted uh, feelings that some may have, but 
at the same time, um, you know, I, I think there there is an ability for for people to get excited and and um, you know we can we can still remember and 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 try and get better based on what happened every single day while also being excited about this. And so um, you know what I think there's there's a place for both feelings in in uh, in this in in what happened on Monday and winning the lottery. And, you know, obviously winning the lottery and uh, and having the right to take the, fir- the first player in the draft does, doesn't uh, ensure player development, right? So part of, the, part of the goal is not only to get the talent, but to help develop the talent. And I wonder, um, when you're talking about young guys coming in, how do you, how do you build up uh, around them? And I'm, I'm talking specifically – on the line they'll play on. Do you want to, if you have a guy like Luke, Lucas Reichel here, do you want him on the same line with a guy he may be playing with for a decade, or would you prefer to sort of protect those guys in a different way and then maybe unite them later? How, how, how enticing is the idea of, of getting people how it's going to look moving forward, or is it more important to make sure you've got protection and you've got cover for people? Uh, yeah, yeah it, it, those are the discussions that are going on right now and, and things we've talked about for, for quite some time here, uh, you know, surrounding a couple of players in the draft. And I think the one thing that is common of, of the, the top prospects in this draft is they're all centermen. Um, and, and so it, it's, you know, I think it's, it's trying to find the right mix and the right uh, complement to those players on their wings. Um, you know, I, I think the one thing – with Lucas in particular is we, we wanted him to spend, you know, that little extra time in Rockford because we wanted him to play center. And, and, and I think that's still something we're going to look at. Um, you know, obviously we bring in the first overall pick and, and all those prospects are centermen. And if we want Luke to play center too, then, you know, maybe that's, that's a dynamite one, two punch that we can, we can, uh, we can count on for a long time or, you know, Maybe we do put them on the same line. There's a lot of there's a lot of different uh, options to us. I don't think you necessarily have to go out and do it uh, in training camp and and get that set right away. That's that's something we can we can kind of tinker with and 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 play with moving forward. But um, you're definitely you're definitely always thinking of the the team building aspect. You can't have a lot of players that are the exact same way. And and the other thing you know we talk about a lot is there's only one puck out there. And if if a player requires you know, to have the puck on their stick more than their line mates, then you don't want to put two players like that together. And so it, it's just thinking about those team dynamics, those line dynamics, and, and making sure that we're giving everyone the best opportunity to succeed and, and, and fulfill their, not only their potential, but, um, you know, their, their short-term success. Kyle, I want to follow up on what you answered earlier because what I asked in terms of the culture you're trying to create and, and how you're yep. trying to move on from that, because – I think it was about a year ago after the town hall and Rocky Wirtz said what he said, that it was Wayne Gretzky who talked about uh, very publicly, he said something to the effect, and I'm paraphrasing here, that you know, if I had an 18-year-old kid and I was going into the Blackhawk organization, I would, want to, I would want to know how they were going to protect him in light of what's happened, in light of the reaction to that. You're dealing with a lot of kids who are still teenagers. The, the number one prospect, Connor Bedard, 17 years old. If his parents, if any parents of a prospect were to ask you that question now before the draft next month, how would you answer it? Yeah, you know, I think it'd be it, it's again, you know, these are these are concerns and questions that that um, that people are, are are asking, and and I feel very comfortable with with the culture we've created. You know, especially in the the locker room with you know head coach Luke Richardson and and his advocacy for um, you know not only mental health awareness, but having mental health professionals uh, available to all of our players at all times. Um, you know, we, we advertise and, and, and make uh, available reporting, uh, anonymous reporting lines for our players should they experience anything or need to report anything. Um, and, and it's something we're, we're working on and we're communicating with, with our players, with our staff every single day and, and making the resources available to um, provide that that reporting, that safety, and that education to everyone should they need to use um, you know, need to use it and, and, and go down that road. So, you know, we've we've put in a lot of different processes and, and, and systems here to ensure 
that that there's uh, you know the necessary resources available to protect people to uh, to be made available to our players and staff. And I don't think it's exclusive just to the the players coming in, right? It, it's it's also available to every one of our staff members um, to make sure that they feel protected, that they may, that they feel safe in in their place of work, whether that be the locker room or in the in the front office here at the United Center. Um, you got to feel like you got the right coach with uh, with him. I mean, uh, Luke Richardson, he might have been too good a coach, frankly, <laughs> at the end of the season there. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know what? The, the thing is, is that I think the, the way things ended up is the way they were supposed to end up, obviously. Well, for us anyways. And, and the one thing that I, I will say about Luke is that he was able to get the players, and it's also a credit to the players here as well, that they played hard right to the end. Like, you know, Andreas Athanasiu scored with under two minutes left in game 82 to tie up a game against another non-playoff team. And and we came back from I think two two goal deficits in that game in the last game of the season. They were these players were done with their whole year two hours, but you know after that game started. And so uh, to to get players to to commit and to show up every single night in in a season where playoffs were were lost fairly early uh, in the year or were uh, were a very you know unrealistic hope very early in the season. That's impressive, and to to play a style of play from day one to game to day, you know, one eighty six or game eighty two. That's that's the indication of a good coach to be able to get buy in. And and when you walked into that locker room, you know, whether it was after uh, you know a, a five game losing streak or or a three game winning streak, there was no difference. It was always positive. It was always upbeat, and that's at the direction of of the coach and the coaching staff. And so uh, I'm really excited with. Uh, with with how things are going in the in the locker room and, and with the the coaching staff, I think we're really really lucky to have not only Luke but but the whole group we've got down there. And so we're we're in a good spot behind the bench. Kyle had to be draining that last month. You traded Patrick Kane and all that came with that, and then you staged the farewell to Jonathan Taze and all that came with that. And now you're kind of moving forward without either guy part of the future for the first time in a very long time. Number one, how much. How difficult was that to, to handle emotionally? And secondly, can we rule out Kaner in free agency because of the way that you have moved on? Yeah, you know, I, I think I think we did make our decision that we were going to move on from from Jonathan and Patrick, and and it was not not an easy decision, but one we thought gave these young players coming in the best opportunity to grow into those uh, into those leadership roles that that Jonathan and Patrick filled for so long and filled so amazingly for so long and so um you know it's it's it, it was something we we decided uh you know kind of around trade deadline and then with jonathan later in the later in the game a bit but it's it, it's uh you know we think it's important we think it's really uh giving these young players the same opportunity that patrick jonathan and and many others that were part of that that core group uh, in the in the 2010s uh when they entered the league you know, there was no, uh, you know, franchise player that that was there that they could just lean on and 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 use as, uh, you know, somewhat of a crutch or or have to de- defer to. It was, it was, it's going to be up to those young players to, you know, with the assistance of some leadership. Let's not, let's not, um, you know, kid ourselves. We're going to have some good leadership in that locker room for them, but it's going to be up to them to to take on on leadership roles, and we think that's that's really healthy for their development and will serve them very well down the road when it comes time for for them to completely take over the leadership of the teams. 